Here is Mark Kasevich. I, I want to begin by uh, thanking the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, this talk I'm going to tell you about precision atom interferometry work that's underway at Stanford University. Uh, by way of introduction, I, I want to uh, do a back of the envelope uh, calculation that's a, li a little rough around the edges, but kind of uh, hopefully will uh, motivate why we're interested in, in doing the experiments we're doing. Uh, the, th the situation I want to envision is the following. I want to uh, take a rubidium-87 atom, and by some mechanism, I want to uh, put it in a coherent superposition state where uh, one part of center of mass superposition state where uh, one of the, the two wave packets of this atom is, is at an, an elevation, say, at, at near the stage here, and the other uh, wave packet is 10 meters uh, vertical, vertically separated. And what I want to do is, in my mind's eye, uh, hover these wave packets separated by 10 meters for, on the order of a second, and then bring them back together and uh, measure the uh, interference phase shift which accrues in that configuration. And just a, a, a bit of a back of the envelope uh, algebra shows that of, if you, the type of, of measurement you can make on the acceleration due to gravity, which is what sets the energy difference between the wave packet here and the other wave packet 10 meters uh, above it, is you, in principle, can resolve uh, changes or measure changes in th that acceleration at the part in 10 to the 20 level. What, what feeds into that calculation is uh, some slightly unrealistic uh, estimates of the type of signal and noise level you can achieve in, in such a measurement, uh, splitting a fringe by a part in 10 to the 5 in a second, and uh, then being willing to collect data for about a, a million seconds. Uh, the, the type of uh, approach we use in, in my group is, is one we, we dub a light pulse interferometry where uh, the wave packets are separated by uh, interactions of uh, the, the, the atom with uh, laser light fields. And I'll, I'll say uh, more about that in future slides. So at, at that, that's about a billion times better than what, what the kind of resolution we have today for uh, terrestrial accelerometers. And it raises the question, what the heck would you do with uh, such an instrument? And uh, one area that we've been focused on in recent years in my group is to uh, seek, seek ways of applying these atom interference uh, techniques to uh, detection of gravitational radiation. And uh, in this talk, I don't have the time to uh, motivate why it's uh, considered interesting to detect gravitational waves. I, what, I, what I will do is put, on, uh, put up a, a, a chart which uh, shows the uh, strain sensitivity of uh, a detector as a function of the frequency of the, the gravitational wave uh, against uh, some, some kind of popular astrophysical targets. Those are shown in uh, these, these blue lines. And the uh, sensitivity of uh, envisioned future detectors. And uh, for example, uh, the, the LISA detector, which is a space-based uh, a uh, detector based on uh, optical interferometry is expected to see a strain sensitivity curve if, if this uh, detector is built that looks like this, uh, capturing, uh, the, the, making detectable many uh, considered interesting astrophysical sources. And the point of this chart is to say that if we were to build an a, a analogous detector with atom interferometers, kind of configured in the, in, in, the, in the way that would give this 10 to the minus 20 G uh, uh, sensitivity I highlighted on the previous slide, uh, in, in such a way we, you know, in, your, in our mind's eye, we have a satellite and a satellite, this is an orbit, and clouds of atoms at, at two locations, and a laser beam that strings between those two that would affect this, the spatial separation and recombination of the atomic wave packets. If that sort of thing were to happen with, uh, oh, sorry about that parameters that are, are given in this inset, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll dig into those a, a little bit over the, uh, the, the, the talk, but just, as, just a, a, by way of motivation, I think such par parameters may be realistic. The type of detector you would build, so-called Aegis here, is uh, competitive with uh, what you kind of 
other plans for uh, detecting gravitational waves. And uh, if you're interested in some of the details there, uh, there's a, a PRL of last year and a more, much more detailed article in GRG uh, in 2011. So uh, to go from uh, theoretical speculation to what we're actually building, uh, we, no, we haven't separated a rubidium atomic wave package yet by 10 meters, but that's, that's what we want to do with the, the following apparatus. What I'm showing you here is a picture of an apparatus that's in the basement of the Varian Physics Building at Stanford. Uh, here it is. It's a 10-meter it's a evacuated tube. At the bottom of that tube is uh, Bose-Einstein condensed and then delta kick cooled uh, source of rubidium atoms. And, and what we do in this apparatus is launch the cloud of atoms up this tube. I'll switch over here up this tube and, and have them fall back down. And over the course of their flight, uh, the atoms are made to interact with pulses of laser light, which coherently uh, divide, redirect, and then subsequently recombine the atomic uh, wave packets. And I'll, as I'll show in uh, subsequent slides, we detect the uh, interference down in this, in this region here. Where we, we look at the, uh, the, the, the cloud of atoms with CCD cameras along two orthogonal axes and look at a uh, resonance fluorescence uh, to, to uh, have a, to capture the, the uh, center mass distribution of the atomic cloud, and then uh, from that image infer, infer uh, the, the presence of uh, de Broglie wave interference. Uh, we're very sensitive to the rotation of Mother Earth, and uh, we need to uh, m make amends by uh, essentially keeping the propagation axes of the laser, the laser beams that uh, coherently divide and uh, redirect and recombine the, the, the atom clouds al along an inertial axis, and we do that with a tip-tilt stage, which is uh, at, the, at the bottom of the vacuum chamber. Some of the uh, you know, figures of merit, we, uh, when, when we launch the clouds, we have about 300,000 atoms at a temperature of a, a, a close to a nanokelvin. Uh, the atoms are launched in an optical lattice, uh, and if you calculate the kinematics, how how, you know, how much velocity do you have to give the cloud to make it go uh, close to 10 meters uh, tall to high, you need uh, a 13 meters per second launch. We do that by transferring uh, a well-known uh, number of photon recoils in, in an optical lattice configuration to the cloud. We then uh, drive the interferometer sequence with a very well-characterized laser beam, and we have plenty of power uh, to, to to drive the transitions, and as I've, I mentioned, we dynamically control the axis of the, uh, of the optical interrogation. And the, our current record statistical resolution, this is in, in one hour, is on the order of uh, you know, just, just below 10 to the minus 12 of little g, and uh, where we hope to be uh, in, the, in the next uh, few months is uh, in order of magnitude of better than that. So if you run through the, the, the standard arithmetic of, of calculating of, you know, what can influence the, the phase of the atomic wave packets when they separate, uh, the, uh, the, this, this is the kind of table that you uh, arrive at. And I, I won't go into details of what, what we call the, uh, in the vernacular the term list. But to suffice to say that the, the dominant phase shift which accrues uh, almost uh, 200 million cycles worth of uh, radians worth of phase is that due to the acceleration due to gravity as the, as the wave packets separate and recombine. And this is uh, now in, uh, in the language of the light pulse interferometer. This is running uh, an interferometer with uh, just a standard two photon recoil atom optic where uh, the transition is driven by a, a simple uh, stimulated Raman transition. But there are some other interesting phase shifts which are actually uh, surprisingly large. And one is this five radian phase shift due to the Coriolis effect, the fact that uh, the, the atom cloud has a velocity spread and uh, even, even at you know, nanokelvin's temperatures. And that uh, couples to uh, the ro rotation of the Earth. And that uh, ex we expect to write a, a multi-radian phase shift across the cloud. And we observe that directly in a way I'll, I'll show you in the a subsequent slide. Uh, there are other interesting shifts. Uh, one I think that is uh, fascinating, which we're seeking to isolate, is this one here, which is uh, the first one where H bar uh, occurs in a way that can't be eliminated. We, we, we call it the quantum curvature shift. It, it couples to the gravitational gradient 
uh, in, in, in our uh, apparatus and uh, the, the, the photon recoil energy. And there are other uh, terms that depend on, uh, you know, kind of dirt effects, I guess you would say, uh, if the, there's wavefront curvature in the, in the laser field or if there's gravitational gradients, and uh, these, are, these are these terms here. Uh, one thing we noted when we were, we were setting this apparatus up was that uh, in, in our configuration, we start with the source, which is essentially a point source, but uh, that source expands ballistically over the 2.6 second flight time from launch till detection. And so uh, by uh, having a spatially resolved detector, we are able to measure, uh, by measuring the position of uh, where, where the atom uh, arrives on the CCD camera, we're able to essentially infer the velocity of, of that part of the, the wave function and therefore correlate these, the, the velocity dependence of the, of the, of the phase with the uh, observed interference pattern. And I'll show you that on the next slide here. Uh, this upper set of uh, images are of a false color process. Everything looks better in false color. The, uh, the blue is uh, an interference minimum. The red is an interference maximum. Uh, and uh, though these are the results of processed images from the CCD cameras. This is a top view of the, uh, the, the tower. And uh, these, each of these images taken as a function of the effective residual rotation rate uh, that uh, is, is uh, when I say rotation rate, the, the, the amount of which the, uh, the, the Raman laser beams deviate from being uh, perfectly inertial. If they're uh, made to be close to, I shouldn't say perfectly close to inertial, then uh, the interference fringe doesn't have, there's not a velocity dependent Coriolis term and the, inter, the observed interferograms are flat phase, uh, you either see all the atoms in the output port or you don't. But if there's a residual uh, rotation, then you see an interference fringes written across the cloud. And the earth rate for our apparatus corresponds to basically uh, this image here, about 50 microradians per second uh, worth of uh, effective rotation bias. And that rotation bias is all affected by how we control the tip tilt mirror at the bottom of the apparatus. So, uh, I, we, we have this beautiful connection between a, a rotation rate uh, and uh, fringes, and so by looking at the fringes, and I, I won't go into details on how we process the data, uh, it stands to reason that we ought to be able to uh, infer a rotation rate, and that's what we do on uh, what I'm showing you on this plot here. And what's significant is that uh, we, we realize a two-axis gyro with this configuration by imaging the atom clouds simultaneously from that direction in that direction. And from a technological perspective, that's, uh, it's, it's pretty important because it, it'll, it'll, it, it allows you to conveniently measure multi-rotation axes with a, a pretty simple setup. Now, this setup here doesn't look simple because I've got a 10-meter tower, but for a practical device, say in space or uh, for on a navigation platform, you, you don't need to uh, invoke this 10-meter uh, this trajectory to get interesting sensitivity limits. Uh, you can also, by hand, uh, go ahead and uh, introduce fringing across the cloud, uh, and, and one way of doing that is just to, uh, at the, at the, the, in order to uh, divide, redirect, and recombine the pulse, the, 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 the uh, atom wave packets, we apply pulses of light at that third pulse. If we shift the propagation axis of the laser beam just a little bit, uh, when you work through the phase shifts, what that does is it, it writes a phase shear across the cloud. And so uh, here are some examples of the phase shear written across the cloud as a function of the, the tilt angle on that mirror of the, of the, of the final laser pulse. And uh, just to show you how that, that works out in, uh, in, in, the, in the real uh, not false color, proce false color image process data, here's what the uh, camera sees. We have two output ports uh, for the two uh, rubidium states we detect. And uh, as from one shot to the next, uh, the, the uh, face of the, 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 the fringe, uh, uh, the, the, the fringe, the, the, uh, what am I trying to say? This, this pattern shifts from side to side, but what's important is the, uh, the periodicity of that fringing, spatial periodicity, uh, doesn't change. And that spatial periodicity is a, is a measure of uh, the, the, the shear we apply. What's uh, important about this method from, from a practical perspective is, uh, it, uh, let me highlight this. It enables us on a single uh, shot to both uh, estimate the contrast and the phase of the interference fringe. Now, in this data, uh, there are, as I mentioned, there's a huge contribution to the phase shift due to the acceleration due to gravity. 
uh, and in fact, uh, also technical accelerations of, of the laboratory floor mass themselves as gravitational acceleration. And so the overall phase is jumping from one shot to the next, which is why when I showed you that sequence of images, uh, that the phase appeared to, to, to randomly slide back and forth. But what was nice about that data was, the, again, the spatial period of the fringes was, uh, was uniform, and that was a reflection of the applied rotation rate. Uh, so when it, you go and you look at, the, analyze those fringes, again, focusing on rotation as your interesting observable, it turns out you, you can build an, uh, an instrument which is uh, of interest to the navigation community, which is a, a so-called gyro compass, which tells you which direction a true north is. And, and that basically was done by changing the tip-tilt angle of that mirror and finding a position where the, uh, the, the fringe uh, periodicity uh, di didn't change uh, as, a, as a function of plus and minus tilt angles. And that's what this data here shows. Uh, so we'd like to do better in terms of gyros gyroscopy. And uh, gyroscopy there is kind of a proxy for uh, you know, uh, you know, other uh, future precision measurements, uh, gravitational physics uh, oriented and, and so forth. And uh, one mechanism or method uh, that's, that's kind of uh, uh, now accepted in the field for, as, as, a, as a way of Im Im improving uh, the sensitivity is to put more pulses of light in the interferometer to achieve larger uh, wave packet separations over the course of the uh, measurement. And so uh, this is a kind of a, a schematic representation of the type of pulse sequences uh, that, that we had in mind a few years ago with a proof of concept apparatus. This, this was done with, not in that 10 meter tower, the data I'll show you, but in a surrogate apparatus uh, with a, a Bose condensation machine. And basically, instead of having a single pi over two pi and pi over two pulse, we strung together a, a sequence, of, a sequence of Bragg pulses in order to affect much larger separation of the, the center mass of, of the atomic wave packets. And so uh, in this proof of concept apparatus, we were able to impart 102 phot recoils, photon recoils worth of uh, momentum between two wave packets. And uh, because we were working with short interrogation times, not the 1.3 seconds associated with the 10 meter uh, time of flight through the apparatus, the wave packet separations were only on the order of a millimeter. But what was exciting to us was this was a proof of concept demonstration of, you know, here, can we make a large momentum recoil of, of sequences effective uh, in, in, in uh, interferometer context at all. So the natural next step for us was to go and try large momentum recoil sequences uh, in that 10 meter tower. And that's what we've been at over the course of the last year. And our, our record to date is a 12 photon recoil sequence where amazingly uh, at the apex of the tower, when, after I've done that first uh, pi over two beam splitter and imparted 12 momentum recoil, photon momentum recoil between the the wave packets, the, the wave packets separate by eight, eight centimeters. So uh, what I'm saying we're doing is we're able to see interference over two wave packets that are separated by ab about that much over a time scale of uh, seconds, bringing them back together. That's this data point here. We have about 20% contrast. In order for that to all work out, the two photon recoil interferometer was, was nearly perfect. The interference contrast was greater than 98%. In fact, you know, we're just hesitant to overstate the claims, but if you look at some of the data, it just looks like 99.5 to me. But uh, at any rate, uh, as, as you march up this diagram, here's a, a, a six photon recoil uh, picture of, of that's taken at the top of the tower when the wave packets were separated. Of course, when I take a shot like that, I wipe out the interference but just to get the picture, but it's a pretty picture. And uh, the reason why we don't have a picture up there at the, at the uh, eight centimeter separation is because the, it's out, our, our camera field of view isn't big enough to capture both uh, wave packets at the same time. Uh, you say, well, what's, you know, I, 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 to get 10 meters, I need a heck of a lot more than uh, 12 photon recoils. What's limiting us to 12 right now? And, uh, that was a combination of a bunch of inhomogeneous broadening factors and residual spontaneous emission due to, uh, from the laser system uh, we were using to drive the transitions. Uh, and I don't think there's anything fundamental that's going to stop us uh, from, well, I, sh I should hedge my words there. If quantum mechanics doesn't work like the way we think it does, then there will be something fundamental that will stop us. But assuming quantum, non-relativistic quantum mechanics is correct, I think there's just a bunch of experimental dirt between us uh, and the, the, the sort of uh, separations we want to achieve. Well, 
how do I get rid of some of that dirt? Uh, one of the things we need to do is to, even though we have a nanocalvin cloud, we want it colder. And uh, one of the things we've done recently is to use an improved uh, cooling scheme to get now down to effective transverse temperatures that are measured in picokelvins. And we do that by uh, basically lensing the atoms at the top of the tower with a, 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 a near-perfect lens created by a, a laser beam of light. The AC Stark shift from this beam of light can serve to uh, focus the atom cloud or collimate the atom cloud at the trajectory apex. And if you, uh, you know, kind of work through the numbers of what's achievable, you, you, you learn that you should expect very cold temperatures, to effective temperatures to come out of that. And uh, that, that's what we've uh, been able to realize. At this, at this level, at, at 50 picokelvin, we, we've taken any inhomogeneous broadening due to velocity out of the equation, and I think that should dramatically improve our contrast. Uh, it's interesting, there is, there is fundamental physics statements to be made about uh, the truth of quantum theory right now, and uh, the, the, the type of measurements we're doing are, are putting new uh, and I think important constraints on quantum mechanics. Uh, if you say, you know, at some point maybe quantum mechanics breaks down and, and it won't allow a superposition state to exist, uh, and there are various theories that, that are going in the name of spontaneous localization and other theories uh, like, like that, that would maybe collapse the wave function uh, as they separate. Uh, it turns out that the data I've just presented provides really pretty stringent constraints on uh, possible violations, and the, the kind of constraints, this is the paper we're following due to Nim Richter and very nice PRL in 2013. Our constraints now are some of the most stringent that, that exist, and the, the fact that we can observe temperatures at the, the 50 picokelvin level actually turns out to put a, a substantial constraint on possible residual heating due to localization of a, of a wave function, and that's what's shown here. And the fact that we see interference out at, at eight centimeter scales is, is what's shown there. And these other curves are curves associated with other experiments uh, that people envision in the future associated with interference of uh, macroscopic objects and so forth. Uh, and I think that um, my perspective is, I'd like to take these most, I mean, <laughs> We, we've been trained to believe that non-relativistic quantum mechanics is correct, but uh, you know, on the other hand, we all know that there are things that don't make sense about that theory. Uh, you know, it pass, doesn't pass basic sniff tests, and I think it's important to push uh, frontiers in this way. And, and maybe uh, you know, we find that at some distance scale, or some time scale, or some energy scale, that in fact quantum mechanics doesn't uh, obey the Schrodinger equation like we think it should. Uh, Let's see, what else, just as kind of a, a technological gee whiz thing you can do, once we can refocus the atoms with that, that pulse of light, what we, what we were able to do was to launch the atoms and capture them in the lattice and launch them again, and uh, we, we realized about five seconds of quasi-inertial free fall. It's, 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 well, there was one rather violent period where the atom cloud was caught and then re-accelerated. That lasted about 20 milliseconds, but otherwise, this atom just kind of bouncing along this, this tube, and of course we would hope to be able to get more bounces, and we have to improve the efficiency of the catch and relaunch. Uh, I'd like to spend the last two minutes essentially advertising a poster that, uh, uh, that will be given by uh, uh, Raj, a student in my group, uh, on Thursday, and that is uh, one of the other things we're seeking to do is to improve the signal noise on the, on the readout of the inter interferometer. And, uh, what we're doing is using standard spin-squeezing techniques to uh, prepare an initial input state to the interferometer, which is, is spin-squeezed, and we're doing that with a cavity QED-type uh, apparatus shown in this picture here. Uh, this is not in the 10-meter tower, but our research plan is to put it in the 10-meter tower, and here's a, here's a, a, a picture of uh, Raj's apparatus. There's a, there's a mott, and it's, it's in, uh, that mott sits in between two mirrors uh, that uh, create a high finesse uh, Fabry Pro cavity, both at 780 nanometers to do the spin squeezing and also at 1560 nanometers to uh, localize the atoms in, in, at, uh, at, at the, the appropriate positions in the cavity so we have a uniform mode coupling between the, the atoms and the, the squeezing beam. And this is the, the uh, I, I know this is going too fast now, but this is, this is a schematic of the, the laser system. The bottom line is here's the science cavity and we read out the number of atoms in that cavity uh, via a homodyne uh, phase shift on the, uh, the, the, the probe beam that goes through the cavity. And just to show you some of the, the results that we're uh, achieving now with this uh, scheme, of, first thing we, we can do is we can make 
very good measurements of uh, atomic shot noise, which uh, you know you aficionados in quantum optics know is the key step to uh, claiming that you have a squeezing working, and uh, that's what we're doing here. We we prepare the atoms in a coherent spin state by first optically pumping them into one of the hyperfine ground state levels and then applying a pi over two pulse. Uh, and then we go and read out the number of atoms uh, in, that, in, in, that, uh, in, in, in the waist of the cavity with uh, our homodyne probe signal. And we repeat this uh, you know, zillions of times to get a distribution of, uh, of atom number measurements as a function of the total atom number that we initially start with before we do the uh, the first pi over two pulse. And by varying the total atom number uh, and measuring the width of this distribution, you, we, we accurately map out a shot noise. Now we can follow that up with a, the, the second experiment, which is uh, instead of uh, uh, resting on our laurels and, and after that first probe measurement going and, and binning, uh, uh, making a histogram bin, we can come in with, after we, we do a state, state we pi over two pulse, then probe pulse, uh, which now is going to be our, our, our squeezing pulse, we come in with a second pulse and measure the, 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 uh, the, the atom number, uh, the, the fluctuations we observe uh, in, in a histogram where we difference those two is really quite narrow. In fact, if we compare the width of this, this distribution to the width of one of our shot noise distributions, this indicates a 17 dB reduction in variance. Now, I haven't demonstrated squeezing yet, the final thing I have to do is to show you that coherence still persists. And so we do that for the, the same data sequence. Now, uh, is we pi over two, we then probe with the, uh, the squeezing pulse, and then we, we follow that up with a, 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 an echo pi pulse, a probe pulse to echo out some inhomogeneities due to AC stark shift, and a final pi over two. And uh, that's, that's the result is shown in red when we have the squeezing uh, beam on and uh, blue when we don't. And what this is data is showing is that there's essentially no loss of contrast, even though I've succeeded on the previous slide of showing you I could measure atom number at a level that's 17 dB below the shot noise level. So we're quite excited by this because what this means is I, I think we can put this state prep in the front end of any of our free space interferometers. And uh, you know, if, we, if I keep our wits about us, when we detect the atom ensemble after the interference sequence, we, we may be able to realize a, a pretty substantial gain in a short-term sensitivity. That's all I had to say. This is the future is to try and get this LMT plus spin squeezing all the work out in that tower. And uh, at this point, I want to uh, thank the people who contributed to the work and thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, time for questions. So, uh, gentlemen over there. So it's hard to have an intuition what the sensitivity that you're aiming for in the end really means concerning the constraints on the environment. So can I ask, are humans allowed to move <laughs> while you're integrating? Can a park, car change? Yeah. its position outside of the building. Yeah, the, the, the sensitivity is really pretty extraordinary. And I should add that, should add that you know, any, any of these measurements we're conceiving of that exploit that sensitivity are designed to common mode reject you know, the, the wandering human or car. But if, 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 if we didn't do that, then uh, you know, even, even at the 10 to the minus 13 G, well, OK, so two humans sitting right next to each other, that's about 10 to the minus 9 G of uh, gravitational attraction. And so uh, the kind of sensitivity levels we're achieving right now is like if you had a cup of coffee, I could weigh you and I can tell you had the cup of coffee kind of thing. And so, yeah, yeah we, it's, it's, that's, that turns out to be a pretty substantial limit on some of the experiments we're envisioning. So the last part of the, of the talk was, was pretty quick about the squeezing. And yeah. I'm not sure, did you squeeze? Or didn't you? And what 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 what, what did you actually? What, what was the 17 uh, uh, dB? And just just give us a little bit more. I know you were yeah, going really yeah, well, fast. So I, I directed to Raj's poster on Thursday, but uh, yeah, I, th I think we, we we did squeeze. So what what we did was we uh, we we start with uh, the atoms in the ground state. We do a pi over two pulse, and we come in with the squeezing beam, and uh, that that projects. Uh, there's a coherent s s a distribution of uh, atom numbers uh, values that then uh, gets projected to a, 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 a much smaller range, 17 dB smaller range. Uh, and uh, we, 
uh, observe that, that that projection occurred by following up with a second probe pulse that measures, the, you know, measures that the number that was prepared by the, the first probe pulse. And so when we subtract the, the value that from the first measurement to the second measurement, that's where we infer this 17 dB value. Uh, that alone is not squeezing because I could do that with resonance fluorescence or you know, if I kept my wits about me a number of atom uh, counting techniques. But what, what kind of seals the deal for squeezing is that I can do the exact same thing but then put it uh, into uh, an interference pulse sequence like a, a photon echo sequence and show that I can have close to full coherence uh, when, when I, uh, for example, vary the phase of the microwave drive of the, the final pi over two pulse. So I think, I think that's all stacking up to uh, being a really uh, a squeezing measurement. And also I, I think we're, the, 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 the dBs I'm quoting are metrologically significant and in the lingo because I really haven't wiped out contrast in, in, the, in the way we've done this. Uh, and what, the, what needs to happen next is to actually do an honest to goodness clock measurement or, you know, or an accelerometer measurement and show that the sensitivity has improved by uh, the level that we think it should. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, uh, this concludes this session. So let's thank all uh, the speakers once again.